you, that you've showered upon us, not ourselves, but everybody here. And Lord, we just pray again that you would bless our time now in the Word and that the Holy Spirit be the master teacher. For we ask it all in our precious Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Okay, I have been debating all night what to talk to you about, but I think the favorite subject that my detractors attack me for, and they hate yeah. me for it, is the concept of two Gospels. And it drives them up the wall. There's only one Gospel. Well, I'm going to show you how to tell those people that there are two Gospels. So I know you know it, but I'm just doing all this to refresh your memory. All right, we're going to start from the, the back end, as I say, and we're going to work toward the front. We're going to start with Paul and work back to the gospel of the kingdom. All right, start with Acts 20, 24. Acts 20, Acts 20 verse 24. Now, I'm going to watch the clock because we've got to be over there to Beverly's by 5.30, so we've got to be aware of time. Five. Well, she shoot for five. She started five. She told us to be there at four thirty. Then you start. You do your talk at five. That's right. Oh, it'll never happen. Six. <laughs> Six. Wait a minute. He did He has to get his Bible in the car. Oh. Okay. All right. But anyway, you all got Acts twenty. Yeah. Verse twenty-four. Oh, I got my Bible. You haven't got yours yet either. <laughs> I got it right here. That's right. Today. How far did he have to walk? He's probably parked out in the pasture, huh? <laughs> I don't know. The far are we in? Corinthians? No, Romans. Acts. Acts. And then we're going to 1 Corinthians. Okay. Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear. Now this is Paul speaking through Luke. I count my life dear in myself that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. Now mark that down. He didn't get it from James, Peter, and John. He got it from the Lord himself from glory to testify or to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God. All right, how many of you have ever tried asking someone just a simple question? What is the gospel? Have any of you ever tried it? Shame on you. You should try it all the time. Just ask people, what is the gospel? And you'll be shocked. My last call Friday afternoon, a lady had done it with her preacher. And she said, Pastor, what is the gospel? She says, he had a blank look. Duh. Well, he said, the good news. She said, yes, the gospel is good news, but that's not the gospel. He didn't know, and he was the pastor. And that happens all the time. Now, I'll bet my ranch. Now, that's quite a chunk today. I'd bet my ranch that nine out of ten people, if you ask, I don't care what they are, Sunday school teachers, preachers, deacons, relatives, friends, what's the gospel? They can't tell you. Can you? What's the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Okay, now let's look at it. Now remember, this is the gospel of the grace of God, and it's the only place in Scripture that designates it as the gospel. And that's what I want to hammer home. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, you all know what it is. I, I'm not aware of that, but... I want you to see it with yourself that this is what the Bible calls the gospel. Now look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, so he's writing to Christian believers in Corinth, which I got to stop a minute. Have you ever stopped to think how in the world did those pagan, sexually immoral people become believers by just hearing the death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, they had no knowledge of Israel's God. They had no knowledge of the Word of God. They had no knowledge of what we would call morality. They were pagans. And I can't emphasize enough that the heart of pagan worship was sex. All the priestesses in all the temples were prostitutes. And those are the kind of people that Paul saw saved. I mean, I can't get over it. 
how in the, it had to be a miracle. It had to be God working miraculously to get the gospel off the ground. But no, ever. Now look at what it says. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, the Corinthians, I declare unto you what? The gospel. The gospel. See? Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which? What's he referring to? The well, the gospel. By which also you are saved. Now that's as plain as language can make it. That this is the gospel that saves people. Not taking Jesus into your heart. Not walking down the aisle. Not falling down at the altar. That, that's not the gospel. You know, I wish Greg was here. I'd put him on the soapbox and say, Greg, tell him. What do all these Baptists tell you when you ask them? Now he's out in the workaday world. I ain't not so much anymore. I used to be, but not anymore. So he'll ask you. He's got more guts than I ever had. If you die tonight, why do you think you'll go to heaven? And they're all the same answer. Well, when I was a kid, I walked the aisle. I got saved. I got baptized. I join the church. I give. I do work. I do this and I do that. And then he stops and he says, now wait a minute. All I've heard is I, I, I. What do you do with what Christ has done? Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> See? Now those people aren't saved. They don't have a clue. But they're church members. They've been dunked in that tank. And that's all they know. See? The gospel? Well, they'll look at you with a blank look. But this is the gospel that saves. Now I want you to get it down pat. How that? Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that? Now here comes the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Now back up to Romans 1.16 and see how we are to treat this gospel. See, these are the two verses I always put side by side. Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. Well, the pages are still turning, so I wait. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, what's the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. The work of the cross. That which Christ said is finished. Well, if it's finished then why are preachers adding all this garbage to it? Baptism, tongues, good works, tithing. God won't have it. Paul says it as plain as day in Galatians 1, 6 through 9, that if anybody adds one iota to this gospel, they lose it. Look, now remember that. That's scary. The first time I caught that, it just it gave me the chills. How many people are going to go to hell thinking they were okay because they simply added to the work of the cross. Multitudes. Multitudes. See, I try to get people to think. You know that. Look at all the millions upon millions of Lutherans. Well, let's start with the Catholics. One billion Catholics, like I told you yesterday. The old boy let me know that one billion Catholics can't be wrong. Did oh, but they are. Romans 1.16. That's where it comes. Romans, yeah. Romans 1.16. All right. So think of that one billion Catholics. All going to a devil's hell because they, they know all about the death, burial, and resurrection in their religion, but they don't take it as gospel. Look at all the millions of Lutherans, Presbyterians, Church of Christ, Episcopalian, Church of England, Methodist, Congregational. They are all guilty of adding to the gospel. They're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. And it's frightening. And when you stop to think, 
even our loved ones, are they going to make it? If they are adding anything to this gospel, no. Now look what Paul says about this gospel. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the single only one. For it, the gospel, is the power of God. Now there's where it comes in. Just walking the aisle isn't the power of God. Getting dunked in a tank isn't the power of God. But believing the gospel is. <clears throat> For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and repents, <laughs> walks the aisle, gets baptized, and joins the church. No, it doesn't say that. To everyone that what? Believe. Believeth. Believe. What follows believeth? Yeah. Period. Have <laughs> I made my point? Yeah. All right, now that is Paul's gospel and plan of salvation. All right, now, what does the world of Christendom all of my adversaries. What are they all upset about? Paul preached the same thing that Jesus and the twelve preached. Now that's what I hear all the time. Les, where do you get this idea of two apostles? Paul didn't teach anything different than James and Peter and John and Jesus. Oh no? Now let's just go back. Like I said, I'm starting from the front. Now we're going to go back. Go all the way back to Matthew. And all these, I know I'm, like I said yesterday, I know I'm teaching the choir. But I'm just refreshing all this so that you can pass it on to those poor, blinded, benighted souls all around you. Matthew 10, starting at verse 5 and 6. You all know these verses. I know you do. What do you need? Oh, there's all kinds of them. Matthew 10, 5 and 6. He has just chosen the 12 disciples, Peter, James, John, and all the rest of them. Verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded him, saying, Go not. Now I've got to stop from experience. We get people around this kitchen table more than once who have shown this verse to their preacher and tell him to read it. And whether it's a work of Satan or what, I don't know. What little three-letter word do they always miss? N-O-T. N-O-T. They miss it. Now read it without that. These twelve, he said, go into the way of the Gentiles. See? I can't believe it, but it happens all the time. These preachers do not see that N-O-T. And that makes all the difference in the world. Go not to a Gentile. Go not to a Samaritan. And of course Jesus didn't with two exceptions. And he's God so he can make exception. And he made two. That's all. Anytime your preacher tries to tell you that those multitudes that came and followed him, they were after the free lunch. They had nothing to do with spiritual things. Alright, now then. What is the heart of well, let me back across the page to uh, chapter 9, verse 35. Now, here we have the terminology that I'm looking for. Matthew 9, 35, where Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, be aware of that. That's not the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of the kingdom. All right, now then, that's what he told the twelve. Go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel and preach the gospel of the kingdom. All right, now come over to Matthew 16. We're going to do this quickly, but this is what I want you to do with people if you have a chance. Take this same series of verses and just walk them through it. Now we come to Matthew 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the borders of Caesarea Philippi. Now that's clear up at the northern border of Israel, right next to Lebanon. And he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Everything but the right thing, see? But he said unto them, Whom say you that I am? And I imagine Simon Peter was the only one that really knew at this point in time, maybe John. 
But I don't think the rest of them were totally convinced. But Simon Peter answered and said, <coughs> Thou art the Christ. Now you always got to remember, what's the other word for Christ? Messiah. Messiah. See, you're the Messiah that's been looked for for now for 1,500 years. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now that's the heart of the gospel, and to show you that it is, come along with me now to John's gospel, chapter 11. And we have the death of Lazarus. And we got the poor sisters weeping and wailing. And verse 23. John 11. Yep. John 11, verse 23. And Jesus said unto her, no, I'm sorry. Jesus, yeah, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Remember, Lazarus is dead. He's in the tomb. Martha said unto him, Oh, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? All right, now I've got to stop. Do they have any inkling that he's going to die? No, not a clue. You know, I, I've got an interesting little book. It's written in uh, letter form. It's a letter from the daughter living in Jerusalem to her Jewish father living over in Egypt at the time of Christ. It's an interesting little read. And she writes everything that's taking place in Jerusalem. And even at this event, the death of Lazarus. It's a graphic account written as if she's a teenage lady to her father over in Egypt. Man, I've read the thing three times and I, I enjoy it every time. But anyway, there's no hint that he's going to be dying. Now then, verse 27. Here is her profession of faith and it's word for word with Peter's. Yea, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ the Son of God who should come into the world. Plain enough? All right, that's at the heart of the kingdom gospel. Now move up with me to Acts. Chapter 8. I think most of you know when, when I held those all-day seminars, I never knew what I was going to speak on until I got up there in the, in the pulpit. And that's about where I am this morning. See, I had no idea that I was going to do this. All right, now in chapter 8 of Acts, you've got the account of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, who I feel was a, a Jew. I see no reason to place him as a Gentile uh, proselyte. I think he was a Jew who, just like Joseph was second man in Egypt, Moses was second man in Egypt, uh, poor old Daniel was second man in Babylon, second man in Medes. So it's not unusual for a Jew to get high up in these Gentile governments. So I feel that this guy was a Jew. And he was returning after having been at the temple. Verse 29, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go near, join thyself to the chariot. So Philip ran to him. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Now verse 31, and he said, How can I, except someone should guide me? So he asked Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare this generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch said, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? All right, now here we come. Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
Now, there's no indication that he talked death, burial, and resurrection, but all he talked about was that Jesus was to be the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist put it, that would take away the sin of the world. But there's nothing in here of death, burial, and resurrection that I can tell. I can't see any of it. All right, now then, verse 36. So they came in their way, and they came to water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be bad? Now stop and ask yourself when you read something like that. Where did he get the idea that he had to have water baptism? Peter well, he got it from Philip. Philip. Where did Philip get it? Now back up to chapter 2. And then he put all this together. This is all part of the gospel of the kingdom. <clears throat> it's not for the gospel of grace. It's for the gospel of the kingdom. Acts 2.38. Y'all got it? I want you to see it with your own eyes. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the mission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Was that in Romans 1.16? No. See the difference? That's not in Romans 1.16, but it's what old Philip was preaching. That's why the eunuch says, why can't I be baptized? See, he'd already repented. He knew that. All right, now then move on. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And the eunuch answered and said, now watch what his confession of faith is. I believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. 37. It says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Period. Kingdom ground. See? All right, now let's show you some more. Turn over with me because I'm going to cut this short because I want to be out of here so that we can get to Beverly's by 5, 5.30. Come over with me to Acts 15, verse 1. And I'll give you a little background for this. You'll have to take my word for it. As most of you know, after several years of planting little churches up there, especially in Turkey, all across the highlands, and as well as at Antioch itself. These Judaizers who were kingdom believers up in Jerusalem, they were believers of what we'd just been looking at. They had repented, they'd been baptized, they believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They knew nothing of the death, burial, and resurrection. All right, now then, those Judaizers were law-keeping Jews who went from one of Paul's churches to the next, telling those poor Gentiles, oh, you can't be saved by Paul's gospel alone. You have to keep the law. You've got to practice circumcision. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized. All of that stuff that Paul had said nothing about. All right, now then, when they had gone in and done that, the Lord finally revealed to Paul, you've got to get up to Jerusalem and talk to Peter, James, and John, because they were the heads of all this. Don't get Peter off the hook. Peter was in charge of all this. And so Paul and Barnabas go up to Jerusalem. And you pick up Paul's account in, in uh, Galatians chapter 2. But here is Luke's account of that Jerusalem council between Paul and Barnabas and the twelve and the Jerusalem church. Now I want you to get that perfectly clear in your mind. They're up at the Jerusalem church Probably, oh, what is it? Oh, at least 45 A.D. Because I feel Paul was saved in 37, began his ministry in 40. Yeah, this is probably about right. About 45, 46. No, it isn't either. It's 51. It's 51 A.D. All right, now look what these Judaizers are trying to force or have been feeding Paul's little Gentile churches. Verse 1, And certain men who came down from Judea, the Jerusalem church, they taught the brethren, Paul's Gentile believers, and they told them, 
except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now how would you like it if somebody would come in right now today and seemingly have far more going for them than Les Felder could ever hope to have and they'd stand right up there and say, now look folks, you cannot go to heaven unless you're circumcised and you keep the law. What would you do? Well, you would probably think twice. Well, that's what happened here. And so these Gentiles were getting confused and some of them were actually following it. That they had to add to Paul's gospel. Now, here's why Paul wrote Galatians. Now, just keep your hand in Acts a minute. Forgive me, I, I can't help it. I gotta jump around to make my point. Turn to Galatians. Chapter 1. Verses 6 through 9. Now it's for this very reason that Paul was prompted to write Galatians. <clears throat> to convince his Gentile people that those Jews were out in left field. Not Paul. And so this is Holy Spirit inspired. Verse 6. I marvel, I'm flabbergasted, Paul says. That you, those Gentile believers up in Turkey, that's where Galatia was. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But it's not totally another, but it's them that trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, I'm not a wine drinker, but the scripture uses wine as a good example. If I had a bottle of wine here, and I only suddenly realized there's not enough here for everybody, so I pour half of it out, and I fill it up with water. What have I done to that wine? I've perverted it. I've corrupted it. All right, now that's what they were doing here with the gospel. They were setting Paul's gospel halfway aside and including this kingdom gospel stuff, see? All right, now then the Spirit prompts Paul to make graphic statements. But though, verse 8, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than you which have preached, but than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed or anathema, condemned. Now do you see that? Have I got the picture? Amen. Here they've taken Paul's gospel now and believe these kingdom gospel preachers that they had to bring in Judaism to make it final. And Paul says, you do that and you cancel the work of the cross. Now that's strong language. I know it is. And now again, look at the millions of people that are adding water baptism to Paul's gospel. And when they do, they cancel their road to heaven. Because that's what the book says, see? And he repeats it for emphasis in verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If anyone preach any other gospel than 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> let him be accursed, see? All right, now then I'll take you quickly back to Acts 15 and uh, see how Can rabid... Can I ask you a question? Huh? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, they they believe Paul's gospel and everything, person, and but they know that hey, I don't, I know I don't have to be baptized, but I want to. Can they do it? And as long as they know they don't have to, or what would you? Say? Well, now, what do you say when somebody says they <laughs> That's something that only God can determine, because you really don't. Now I'll give you a good experience. My poor wife has heard this a thousand times. She's heard it once. <laughs> I was a deacon for 20 years in that Baptist church up in Iowa and a Sunday school teacher. I was chairman of the deacons. I was chairman in the pulpit supply. I was as far up as you could get in that church. And I was 30 years old. And we always interviewed everybody that we baptized, the deacons and the preacher. We interviewed them. Are you sure that you're saved? All right, and we always emphasize that this water baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. And we would hammer that home. 
Many times that was the last thing the preacher set up in the tank. Now you realize that this water has no saving value. Yes, okay. All right, now we came down here in 75, and in 1983, my folks came down here. My mom passed away, and we had her funeral up there in that old Baptist church. Well, we come back from the funeral of the cemetery, and I'm down in the basement in the kitchen having coffee with some of the guys, and the preacher comes in, a young guy. And he said, Les, he said, uh, did you write your mother's obituary? I said, yes, I did. I said, I loved it. I said, why? He's because you separated her salvation at 17 from her baptism at 28. Yeah. I said, so what? Well, now, Les, he said, I trust that you know these old Germans better than I do. You were a deacon here 20 years. Yeah, that's right. He says, don't you realize that when I pressure them, are you sure that if you die tonight, you're going to heaven? He says, what's the first thing off their lips? Been I've been baptized. I about had heart failure. That can't be true. But he says it is. That's all they remember, that they've been baptized. Well, now it's the same way with 90% of Christendom. Ask them, why do you think you go to heaven when you die? Baptism is going to come in there one way or another. It's awful. And it's from that day that I determined never again to condone water baptism because it gives anybody that's baptized a false assurance. Can I, can I tell you about what I tell you about my friend? Oh, let's move on. One minute I can quit. And I'll talk after a bit. But see, realize, realize the importance of this. Your loved ones are resting on that baptism. Infant baptism. Now, I've shared this with you before. I know I have. I had a Lutheran lady at my uh, class at the University of South Dakota at the end of the semester. And she came up and she says, can I have a one-on-one -on -one with you? And I said, well, of course. Go ahead. So she took the chalk. And I'm sure I've, most of you have heard this. But she put a dot on the board. She said, here's where I was born. Okay? She went over horizontally about an inch, another dot. She said, here is where I was baptized and became a child of God. I said, really? <laughs> yes, why? I said, that's when you were saved, when you were baptized in them? She said, absolutely. I said, okay, carry on. So she draws her line up, catechism. Goes another inch or two, confirmation. Now she says, I'm home free. I said, really? You're on your way to heaven. Absolutely. Unless, she says, I totally reject all that and I become a reprobate, then I'm a candidate for the gospel that you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Awful. Now then, to confirm what she said, she sent me a book written by her seminary professor father and underlined wherever he had emphasized that infant baptism as becoming a child of God. Well, then two weeks later, I get another book from her grandfather, who was a seminary professor in Norway. Same way, underlined wherever he had emphasized baptism, see? And I had it happen right here in Oklahoma. A fellow called 5 o'clock. I shared it with you. I know I did. He said, I'm so mad I could bite a spike in half. Why? He said, I just came home from the funeral of a neighbor and a fellow church member. But he says, thanks to you, he says, I knew better, and that's why I'm so mad. He said, that preacher stood up there in that Lutheran pulpit and held the guy's baptismal certificate in this hand, and with the other one, he pointed at the casket and said, our brother is in heaven because of this. So he says, I'm going to write to the head of the Missouri Synod, and I'm going to let him have my, my thinking. And I said, well, if you ever get an answer, send me a copy. Well, three weeks later, I got the copy from the vice president of the Missouri Synod. A whole page emphasizing the Lutheran tradition of infant baptism. He never condemned that preacher one iota. So I know that's for most, I don't say all, that's where most infant baptizing denominations are. The Lutherans aren't alone. The Presbyterians are just as bad. The Christian Reformed, because I remember those churches were all in my little hometown in Buffalo Center. We had Catholic, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Congregational and Christian Reforms, all in that little town of 1,200 people. And those were all my classmates in school. I was the only Christian in the class, and they all knew it. 
they wanted a dance for the junior high prom when we never had a dance, we always just had the banquet. So some of the kids wanted to go to the superintendent and I was the class president. And he wouldn't accept anybody but me and they said, there's no use sending less, he'll never approve of a dance. <laughs> but so I know what those backgrounds are. I know them, I grew up with them. So I'm not talking off the fourth of the, of a nothing. This is where they are. All right, now then we'll quickly we're going to wind up. Go back to Acts 15. Now on top of expecting them to be circumcised, jump up to verse 5. And this is what Paul was up against with his little Gentile congregations. Verse 6, 5. Okay. There arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who were now members of that Jerusalem church. They had become believers of the kingdom gospel. So they were members of the Jerusalem church, but they were Pharisees. They said, it was needful to circumcise them. Now who are the them? Paul's Gentile converts up there in Asia Minor and Antioch and Greece. That it was necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And then these jokers tried to tell me that Paul preached that? <laughs> did he? No. No way did Paul teach circumcision and keeping the law. He was constantly screaming the opposite. You're not under the law. You're under grace. And then they got the gall to tear me apart on the internet. I hear it all the time. And that's their basic argument that less teaches two gospels. Absolutely. Because that's what there was. But they can't see it, see? Well, anyway, I'm going to let you go at that. It's 5 to 12. You want to hit and, Galatians uh, 2 7? Huh? You want to hit Galatians 2 7? Oh, yeah. All right. Yep. Yep. The gospel of circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. Now they've been arguing back and forth all day up there in Jerusalem, Paul against these kingdom believers, Peter, James, and John. Maria, I might as well read verse 6, but these who seem to be somewhat, Peter, James, and John, whatsoever they were makes no matter me, God accepts no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference, in other words, when they shared all their biblical knowledge, <clears throat> when they compared all their biblical knowledge, they could add nothing to me. But on the other hand, now here it comes that John is referring to. On the other hand, when they saw that the gospel of the Gentile, the uncircumcision, was committed unto me as the gospel of the Jew, or the kingdom gospel, was committed unto Peter. Now, I'll go way back 30, 40 years, and a fellow from my Stigler class was the treasurer of the First Baptist Church, and it was in my class. So he came in one night and he said, Les, he said, I had quite an experience this morning. And I said, what? Well, he says, as treasurer, he said, I took the Sunday offerings to the bank, and when I came back to put the receipt with the preacher, he said the door was closed and there were two voices, the preacher and one other guy. And he says, I know it's not right to eavesdrop, but I heard the name Les Feldick and I had to. So he said, I put my ear to the door. And you know what they were saying? And they were talking about this verse 7. And Les Feldick says that there's only one gospel. And he says that this says there are two. And they couldn't see it. They didn't see that this was two Gospels. They kept condemning me from the pulpit on the main street. Why well, had one Baptist preacher go up and down Stigler Street? Don't go to Les Feldick's class. Oh, really? That's not, well, yeah, yeah, that's not unusual. That's not unusual. But now you got both barrels loaded. The next person you try and they say there's only one Gospel, now you know where to go. There's two. The gospel of the kingdom. Now, of course, now see where they, where they accuse me and don't hear me right. The gospel of the kingdom stopped sometime in the Acts period. And then the Jew had to be saved the same way as a Gentile. 
So there's no gospel of the kingdom in the further on down the road. It all fell through the cracks before Paul passed off. And then Peter alludes to it. Now let's show that one a minute. Second Peter, I use this all the time to show them that if they would just use common sense, you would have to agree with me. Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> this is where we got to quit. 2 Peter chapter 3. Now this is just before Peter and Paul were martyred, so we're up there about 68 A.D. And the kingdom economy has already stopped. And so consequently, Peter writes to his Jewish writers and readers, account or understand that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Now look where Peter says you go to for, for salvation. <coughs> even as our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given unto him has written unto you as also in all his epistles that's Romans through Philemon that in all his epistles speaking in them of these things salvation like we've been doing in which are some things hard to be understood and which they that are unlearned and unstable twist as they do also the other scriptures. Now that's a truckload in those two words. That means that Paul's letters were scripture. Just as much as Genesis, Exodus or anything else. It's all scripture. Okay? Alrighty. Time to eat. <laughs> That's all we've been doing for three days. <coughs> now you got a question, I'll answer it. You got a question? <coughs>